All right. Hello, everyone. It is so good to um, have the opportunity to worship with you today. Uh, let us pray so that we can prepare our hearts for worship. Uh, Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, we um, give you praise for giving us another opportunity uh, to worship you today. I pray, Lord, that you would help me be filled with your Holy Spirit. I only speak things that are um, pleasing to you and that are in accordance to your word. Uh, I pray that you would bless us, that you would meet us in a powerful way. Encounter us, encounter us, Lord, in a powerful way. Help us change. Help us to grow. Help us to know how much you love us today. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Okay, here are the announcements for GBC. Uh, welcome to our service today. Uh, we love having you in our service. If this is your first time, uh, or um, if you don't usually join our Zoom meetings, we want to say hi and uh, thank you for joining us. And we hope that you get blessed. And uh, it is great to uh, be able to worship with everyone today. Uh, here are some announcements for our church this week. We will be having communion today, uh, so please have the elements ready. There will be a worship team uh, appreciation lunch uh, on next Sunday, December 20th at 12 p.m. Uh, if you haven't heard or um, you know, if you're not aware of it, please contact Justine uh, and she'll give you all the information that you need. Um, Next year, come 2021, we are going to be offering uh, Bible classes, also midweek prayer, Zoom prayer meetings. Um, and th these are some of the gatherings that we're gonna start doing together next year. Uh, I encourage you to join, not just for the you know, fact of learning or, or knowing more content, as important as, important as that is, uh, but this, I would like it to be a time uh, for us to also fellowship together. You know, fellowship is much needed. Uh, we can't have community the way that we used to. Uh, community in a lot of ways was broken. Uh, so we need uh, to be able to restore a lot of the fellowship, a lot of the community as well, as much as we possibly can. So these will be times not just to learn together, but to fellowship and to keep each other accountable. Uh, to encourage one another, to fellowship, and also to pray together. Uh, so I encourage you to join, even if it's just for that, so we can see you more often. This will be the best way for me to be able to uh, do pastoral care, and I would love to, to uh, have as, as many of our members as possible, so you know we can uh, stay together, uh, stick together, and also so we can pray together. So I encourage you to consider that. More information to come as far as the details, uh, but please be praying about joining one of these uh, groups. <clears throat> mm. A new round of visitations, either via Zoom or uh, in person, will start in 2021. Uh, so be ready for me to contact you and uh, so you can spend some time with me and my family and uh, more details to come on that. The young adults, uh, they are gathering every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Uh, if you have any family members that don't go to church that are in that age group, you know, college, young adults, or even older, um, yeah, have them, uh, give them the information to join every Tuesday. If you would like more details, uh, you can uh, contact Matthew, Chan, or Dennis, and they'll be more than glad to give you more information. We are trying to do a, uh, our last parking lot service of the year uh, next Saturday, December 19th. I say we are trying because not all the details are finalized yet. Uh, we are still waiting to hear from our building uh, ownership uh, and to see if they would allow us to have a parking lot service uh, on the 19th. This is December 19th at 10 a.m. at our Reynolds building in Irvine. Uh, we can no longer do the parking lot services in Buena Park uh, because, uh, unfortunately, um, you know, we will, we, will, we will not have access to this church any longer. Uh, so, but thankfully, we do have our building in Irvine, and we're just waiting for the ownership to contact us back and to let us know if they will allow us to uh, have a parking lot service or not. As soon as we find out, you're going to be getting a text from Matthew Chan, uh, so that you can, uh, you know, reply back and let us know if you're coming uh, so we can reserve your lunch like last time. Uh, so more information to come. Be expecting a text. Uh, if we do end up meeting, uh, we're hoping we can do that. But um, yeah, if you have any more questions, you can ask me after the service or you can also talk to Matthew Chen. <clears throat> Now, for our uh, in-person Sunday services, uh, many of you know, we have been trying to do in-person services in Buena Park in the Rainbow facility for the past almost, uh, almost three to four weeks now. 
And, uh, you know, we, I think we, we haven't had any problems. Uh, nobody got COVID, you know, so I think we can kind of do them and, and I guess as, as safely as we can, even though it's never really safe because there's people, you know, um, uh, different people meeting all the time. Uh, but if you are able and if you are not vulnerable and if you are okay uh, with coming out to in-person services that are held outdoors uh, at the Rainbow facility, we encourage you to do that now. Uh, uh, we're going to be able to continue to have our outdoor services moving forward. So if you are okay with it, um, you can come out Sundays at 2 p.m. Uh, moving forward. Uh, at the same time, knowing that, you know, it is not, uh, there is risk involved. Uh, there's distancing is not always uh, an option. Uh, we have about 45 people the past few weeks. <clears throat> uh, so, you know, uh, it's gonna be a little bit crowded. Um, and knowing that, you know, there's always a chance to get COVID because, you know, there's always a lot of people there. Uh, but, you know, if you're okay with all of that, we encourage you to come out. We also uh, remind you that we have three options to worship at GBC. We still have the online services every weekend on Saturdays. We have the once a month uh, parking lot services on Saturdays. And we have the every week Sunday in-person services at 2 p.m. So there's three ways you can worship. We know everybody works at a different pace and everybody is handling this pandemic at a different pace. So whichever pace you feel comfortable with, we encourage you to join to worship. But if you are willing and if you're able and if you're okay coming to the in-person Sunday services, that's an option for you now. So you can start attending next week, uh, December 20th. Uh, and uh, you, know, you can worship in person with some of us. Uh, also, next week on Sunday, uh, we are going to actually pass out food and gifts to the community, especially to those in need, uh, after the service on Sunday. Uh, so the service is at 12 p.m., uh, 2 p.m., sorry, at 2 p.m. every Sunday. <clears throat> next week, after the service, we're going to pass out gifts and food to people in need in the community. Uh, so you can come for that as well to help, you know, pass out some of these uh, items. Also, uh, before that, during the week, there is uh, help needed to wrap all of these gifts for the community that we're trying to give. So if you would like to donate some of your time to come to Rainbow during the week, the Rainbow facility during the week, to help wrap up uh, so many of these, there's so many gifts, all of these gifts to help wrap them up, you know, you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, we would appreciate that as well. I will be texting you the address to the facility, Rainbow facility, uh, to all of our text groups that we have for church. The, the address was all, would also be on the website and on Instagram, so make sure to check that out. And uh, you can uh, also text me or call me at any time and I'll give you more information on that. But that's, you know, the update as far as, you know, the Sunday in-person worship services and our other services for now. Um, yeah, uh, there's also a lot more need uh, as we see uh, from the people that are coming uh, to the Sunday services. The people in that community are very different from you know, uh, the, the members that we're used to worshiping with uh, uh, in Irvine uh, is very different. Um, you're going to be surprised because actually a lot of them come from a non-church background. Uh, so they don't really, they've never attended church. And you'll be surprised to see uh, how, you know, uh, the kind of background they come from and, and what God is doing uh, in their lives to bring healing and restoration. We need a lot of help, um, you know, we'll give you more details as to, you know, how you can help. But if you are, uh, if you have more questions, perhaps, before we share the details of how you can help, uh, you can always contact me and let me know and I'll give you some information as to, you know, what are some of the needs that we have now that, you know, we have some uh, new people coming to church that have never been to church before. Uh, and that's, you know, sort of what's, uh, uh, what church for us is looking like moving forward. Um, 
You know, Sinclair Ferguson, he said, the church lies at the very heart of Jesus Christ, um, and that's his plan for ministry. The church is Jesus, is in Jesus' heart and is his plan for ministry. Jesus didn't come to save only individuals from sin. Yes, he came to save <clears throat> individuals from sin, but so that these individuals that are saved can, can create, can build a church, a community. Ultimately, Jesus came to build a church uh, by saving every individual sinner. Uh, every individual sinner that is saved must belong to a church. But the beautiful thing about church is that, um, you know, in, in the New Testament, um, we have this picture of the church being a multicultural community. In the New Testament, we have this picture of the church being a multicultural community. The early church, the early church was a multicultural community. Uh, the study that we're doing with our, um, you know, basics of Christianity every month with some of our church members, in that study, it says, as a multicultural community, the church included both Jews and Gentiles, masters and slaves, rich and poor, men and women, single and married, young and old, people from different races and ethnicities. Uh, when, when God creates, a new community in Jesus Christ, that new community will always have some type of diversity. This diversity in the church can serve as a powerful witness to the world because of the various people being brought together for the sake of the gospel. D.A. Carson says that the reason why there were so many exhortations in the New Testament for Christians to love other Christians is because, is because the church is made up of natural enemies that can't love one another. Uh, so in other words, the, the church was diverse, it was multi-ethnic, it was different races, ages, genders, classes, and, uh, and this is why in the New Testament there was so much exhortation for the Christians to love one another because technically it would have been impossible for them to love one another. This is an impossible kind of gathering. All these people from so many different diverse backgrounds shouldn't be able to meet together in one place peacefully. Uh, like, like D.A. Carson said, these are natural enemies. This is uncomfortable. This is, this is not the kind of group that you would see anywhere, but you find it in the church because what unites this diverse group of people is only one thing, Jesus Christ. Although we're different in so many different areas, the one thing that glues everything together, the one thing that brings this kind of diverse community together is Jesus Christ. This is why it's the church, because in Jesus Christ, all of these diverse and different groups, these communities become one. Church is the place where different kind of races can coexist. Church is a place where different classes can coexist, where the rich don't look down on the poor, where the poor are not jealous of the rich. Um, Church is the kind of community where all of these different type of groups of people can exist together and be united. Uh, can you imagine the kind of witness that would be to our world today, especially? This is, this is what church is supposed to be like. This is how Jesus, at the early church initially, uh, wanted the church to be like. This is the model that we have from church. This is something that only can happen in the church. Um, so, you know, this is what we want to see happening moving forward. Uh, all of these different kind of groups of people coming together and becoming more like Christ. And because of that, becoming one, becoming the church. You know, not jealous of each other, not looking down on each other, 
uh, not fighting, not dividing, uh, but really becoming one because Jesus makes us more like him. And the church starts to look more and more uh, like Christ. I think this is perhaps what God might be doing through our church uh, in 2021. I pray and then I hope you pray with me that God can make us into a church like that. Uh, so please pray that God can make us and use us uh, as a church that can be uh, that kind of church. <clears throat> All right. Also, um, let's see. I think that's it. I know it was long announcements, but, you know, sorry about that. Okay, that's it. We'll see you in Zoom afterwards. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask uh, during our Zoom time. See you then. Bye-bye. All right, so we're in our fourth sermon of uh, Philippians. Um, and uh, today we're going to be looking at a sermon titled Future Joy. And, you know, last time we saw that Paul talked about present joy, how he said that he rejoiced because uh, the gospel was advancing through his suffering. That's how. You know, he was presently rejoicing. Today, he talks about future joy. He talks about the things that we need in our lives in order to have, future, in order to have joy in the future. So today, we're going to see, uh, learn from Paul, you know, what are the necessary things that we need in our lives to have future joy so that we can know how you and I uh, can live a life filled with joy in 2021. Uh, so let's see what are these things that Paul talks about that, you know, will bring him joy uh, in the future uh, so that you and I can know how to have joy in 2021. Uh, the first thing, uh, let me read, let's read together Philippians chapter 1, verses 19 through 26. Uh, let's read Philippians chapter 1, verses 19 through 26. This is what Philippians chapter 1, verses 19 through 26 says. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary in your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. So Paul starts by saying that he can have future joy even when life is so hard right now. He can have future joy because of the prayers of the Philippians, because of this community that is praying for him and, and because of, of the empowerment that is coming into his life uh, because of, of, of the prayers that, are, uh, you know, that the Philippians are, are, are praying for Paul. Uh, he's being empowered through the Spirit 
um, by the prayers of the Philippians. Uh, so the first thing that, you know, Paul says, he says, yes, and I will rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. Meaning, I will have joy in the future. This is a future tense. Yes, and I will rejoice. This is how I will rejoice in the future. I will rejoice in the future because of a community of believers that are praying for me. And through those prayers, the Spirit is going to empower me so that I can be delivered. Okay, so that's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that what he really needs, what he really needs uh, in order to have joy, he will rejoice. He will rejoice in the future. He will have joy because of believers that are praying with him, that are praying for him, a community of believers that are praying. Uh, this is what you and I need uh, moving forward uh, in 2021. Our joy will come uh, from being part of a community that prays together and stays together. And this is how we're going to get through uh, 2021 with joy. Even when life is so hard right now, we can have joy if we belong, if we have a community that we belong to, that we are a part of, that we are praying together with and that we're seeing things happening through uh, in order to, uh, to, 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 to get through, you know, 2021 with, with joy. Paul here is saying that, uh, you know, he's saying that he knows that he's going to be delivered. And he knows that it's going to be through the prayers of the Philippians uh, and, and, the, and the empowerment of the Spirit that will come because of those prayers. He knows that he's going to be delivered. But when he's using here the language to know, and when he's using here the language that he's eager, he has expectations, and he has hope, this kind of language of I know for sure, and you know the hope, I have hope that this will happen, this kind of language is actually talking about uh, that Paul believes that God is in ultimate control of his circumstances in life. And God is ultimately the one that's going to deliver him, but he's also going to partner with the prayers of the Philippians to deliver him. So Paul here is saying, I can have future joy because I totally, totally am convinced, I trust in the sovereignty of God that he's in control uh, of my life, of my future. He will deliver me. I know this. I have hope in this. Hope has this meaning that God's going to bring everything together for good in the life of Paul, that he knows that God is the one who's going to deliver him, that his life is not up to, you know, chance or it's not in the hands of the captors who can punish him. You know, no evil can touch Paul unless God gives permission for that. So Paul here is saying, I know, I have hope. I know the one who's in control. I know the one who controls history. I know the one who will deliver me by deliverance here. He's actually either talking about being delivered from prison to be set free or being delivered to, to, to death, being delivered through death to it, it, ultimate salvation with Christ. So for Paul, both are a delivery. Either he gets freed and he goes free to, to, to see the Philippians, or he's killed and is freed to enter eternity to be with Christ. Both are a form of deliverance, of, of salvation for Paul. Paul here is saying, God's ultimately the one that's going to save me. Uh, and, uh, you know, I just need you guys to pray for me because I'm not so concerned about, you know, whether I'm going to be, whether I'm going to live or whether I'm going to die. I'm not so concerned about that. My concern is more than, is this, than in this crucial moment, I do not fail God. In this crucial moment, I don't bring shame, you know, to God by failing Him, by failing in my witness to Him. That's, 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 that's the concern of Paul. Paul is not concerned about whether he's, he's going to live or die. He's going to be set free, you know, from prison or he's going to be delivered to death and ultimate salvation. He, he's not really concerned about that. He's saying, you know what? I want to finish well. 
I want to make it to the end and I know I will because God will deliver me. But I also understand that I need your prayers. Through your prayers, you know, I need the Spirit to empower me so that I will not fail in this crucial moment and so that I will not bring shame to God and that so that I can either be delivered, you know, from, from prison or delivered to eternal salvation, uh, you know, well. He wants to make sure that he doesn't fail in a crucial moment. He, he wants to make sure that he doesn't bring, you know, he's, he doesn't have anything to be ashamed for before God, you know, because he failed him in the end. He doesn't want any of that. He wants total victory until the end. He wants deliverance, full deliverance until the end. And he's saying, I need your prayers for that. Although God is in control and ultimately he brings the outcome God will use your prayers to help me get there. You know, is what Paul is saying. Like John MacArthur says, Paul believed in the limitless, Paul believed in the limitless sovereignty of God. He also knew that God's sovereign plan incorporates the prayers of his people. So yes, God has a sovereign plan, but his plans incorporates the prayers of his people. You know, that's, that's what Paul needed for future joy. He needed to know who's in control, who has ultimate uh, decision about what's going to happen to him. He needed to know that his fate, his life, was not up to chance or, or the enemies you know, that were trying to kill him. But he needed to know that the one that had full control of his life was God. The one that has full control of history is God. What God wills is going to happen. He also needed the prayers of the Philippians. This is what you and I need for us to have joy. Yes, remember Paul said, yes, I will rejoice because of your prayers, because I know if for you and I to rejoice, to have future joy, we need to be part of a community that prays together, prays with each other, stays together, you know, encourages one another. We need a group like this. Paul actually he wasn't being just casual about asking the Philippians to pray for him. This was actually something very serious for him. He really depended on their prayers. He really believed in their prayers. He really believed that when they prayed, God moves. When they pray, God acts. When they pray, the will of God gets done. So he, he not only asked the Philippians, every church he planted, he always asked for prayer, a partnership of prayer, because he really believed in the power of prayer that God would move, God will act, things happen when other believers pray. So he, he asked for believers, for the Philippians, to pray for him, with him, uh, so that the Spirit can use those prayers to bring peace and power into the life of Paul so he doesn't fail at a crucial moment in his journey, in his life towards the end, but he can finish strong and ultimately be delivered. And that's what you and I are going to need. We're going to need to pray. Come 2021, the way you're, you and I are going to find joy is by participating together uh, in, 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 in prayer gatherings with other believers in the church. We are not going to make it without prayer. We're going to have to see God move, act, and make things happen in your life and mine and in our church through prayer. There's no way we can have joy without prayer. We, we pray because we know who has power. We pray because we know who's in control. We pray because we know who ultimately has the answer. We pray because we know who has history in his hands, who controls everything and who ultimately has the last say. So we need to pray. We need to pray. And, you know, we need to pray together and we need to, we're going to be doing this a lot more 
uh, this coming year, but we need to stick together and pray. That's where joy will come from, uh, from other believers believing together, other, believing, other believers praying together. This is where your strength and your power and your joy is going to come from, like it did in the life of the Apostle Paul. So if we want future joy, we are going to need to participate actively in prayer gatherings together with other church members. Whenever church you know, offers prayer opportunities, we are going to have to pray. That's where our joy, strength, and power will come from, uh, like Paul is showing us here. So we need a community of prayer, uh, you know, come 2021, uh, for us to have joy, future joy. Not only that, not only do we need to pray, but we need to have a completely new paradigm shift when it comes to the definition of life. We need to have a complete, completely new paradigm shift when it comes to the definition of life. You know, Paul says that he is ready to, uh, you know, bring honor to Christ, whether by life or by death. And then he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Uh, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. We need a completely new paradigm shift if we're going to have joy in our life. Our lives need to completely change. Uh, our, our belief system, our, the way that we think of you know, success in life, the way that we think of you know, how we do life has to totally change if we want joy in our lives. Paul you know, had only uh, one uh, objective, one objective in life. And that was to honor God, honor Christ, either by his life, if he continued living, like that meant honoring Christ, or death. If he died, he, he's trying to find ways to, to see how his death can become a witness to Christ, how he can honor Christ. The word honor has this sense of making great, uh, something large and great and long and to magnify something. So, so Paul, whether by life or by death, the only thing that he wanted from life was to magnify Christ, to honor Christ more and more. The interesting thing here, though, is that he's saying he would much, much more rather he would he would he would rather die that's that's gain for him he would rather he, he would rather die uh, so that he can be with christ so 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 he can have more intimacy with christ so paul here you know he's uh he's showing us that he, he has a deep intimacy a deep love for Christ, where for him, actually, it's much better to die. He, that's what he prefers. That's, that's, that's his desire and wish, that he can die, because if he dies, he can have more intimacy with Christ. Uh, you know, honestly, uh, I, I wrestled with this uh, particular verse this whole week. You know, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. I wrestled because I couldn't understand. I couldn't understand, you know, how Paul, um, you know, how Paul can say something like this. 
You know, how can Paul say something? I, I wrestled with it because, because how can Paul say that, you know, to die is far, far better. To die is more gain because he can have Christ. It, it didn't make sense to me. It didn't make sense to me. Um, you know, the, it didn't make sense to me because I don't think that way. <laughs> I am ashamed to say uh, this, but I don't think that way. I don't feel that way. Like, I, don't, I don't think it's better to die. I don't think it's more gain to die. I'm actually pretty happy living here on earth. I, I don't have like, you know, um, strong desires of, of dying and going to be with Christ. If I can, I want to live. I don't want to die. I, you know, and that's why to me, it, it didn't make any sense. I couldn't understand what Paul is saying. Um, I wrestle with this idea, this thought, this whole week. At the same time, it made me realize, remember in, in this chapter alone, by the way, we're still in chapter one. In this chapter alone, there's three types of Christians. One type of Christians is the petty pastors who were jealous of Paul and that were trying to give Paul a hard time. And, uh, you know, now that Paul is in prison, they're trying to steal his sheep, his influence, so that they can gain more for self through ministry. They want to become more famous through ministry. And then, you know, we have the other Christians who are afraid, who are living in fear, who were not able to share the gospel because they were so afraid, right? Remember uh, the, the last sermon, there were Christians who were so in fear that they couldn't share Christ because they were so afraid. And they were so afraid because they love this world too much. They love this life too much. They didn't want to lose this life. They didn't want to lose things in this life. They didn't want to go to jail and lose privileges and possibly die. They love this world too much. They loved, you know, self-gain too much. And that's why they had jealousy and that's why they had fear. And then we have Paul, who the only thing he loves and cares about is Jesus Christ. And he's not jealous and he's not afraid and he would rather die. Like, like I can relate more to the other two types of Christians. The ones that want to gain, you know, through ministry for their own advantage. The ones that are more afraid of dying because they like this life a lot. I can relate more to that. I cannot relate to Paul. But again, these other Christians, they struggle with jealousy. They struggled with, you know, fear. And, 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 they, and the reason why is because Christ was not everything in their lives. Like it was for Paul. I had to realize and admit the fact that I don't love Christ as much as Paul did. Christ is not to me as great as it was to Paul. I'm not as obsessed with Christ as Paul was. I'm, I am, I, I, I'm jealous. You know, I rival other ministers so that, you know, I can be better than them. And I struggle with that. And then, you know, like I, I like this life. I don't want to lose this life. So I have fear of, of being faithful sometimes. But that just also shows me how much Christ is, is, is not as big in my life. I don't love Christ as much as Paul did. I am not obsessed with Christ like Paul was. For me, um, I don't love Christ as much. That's what I realized. Because if I did, I would say what Paul is saying, that I want to die so I can go be with Christ. You know, when are, when are the times that we actually won't, we don't mind dying? You know, the times when we want to see somebody we love so much, right? If, if, a, if our, you know, husband dies or wife dies or, or children die and they go to heaven, those are the only times where we say, God, like, I don't want to, the things of this life, like, they mean nothing to me. And I want to, you can, you can take my life. I want to die so I can go be, be with my husband, be with my wife, be with my children who, who went before me. If we really, really loved Christ, 
then that's what it should look like for us too. If we really, really love Christ, then everything in this life should not matter that much, should be meaningless to us. We should not fear, we should not be jealous. You know, we wouldn't mind dying to go be with Christ. If for us too, Christ was everything, to live as Christ, to die as Christ, to die as gain, because we get to be with Christ. Uh, so for me, it didn't make sense how Paul can say that, but it made a lot of sense how little I love Christ, how much I love the things of this world, how far I am from Christ being my true treasure, everything in my life. Sadly, and with much shame, that's what I was able to see in my life. I don't want to die because I love this world more than Christ. Um, and I get jealous and envious and all of that because there's things that I love more than Christ, that I want to gain through Christ, not necessarily gain Christ. Uh, the way to not have jealousy, the way not to not have fear, um, the way to never have your joy stolen from you, even through death, is by, by having a complete paradigm shift, by making life about Christ. Only when we're able to get to that place where Christ is our life, uh, nothing will be able to take our joy away from our lives. Uh, let me read to you a quote from Tim Keller. This is what he says. Our joy in life is not based on the circumstances that we face in life, but in having the right definition of life. If we live for anything else other than Christ, our life becomes wealth, a person, a career, our lives will be filled with grief and possibly even death when we don't have what we want most in life. It'll be filled with jealousy, envy, comparison, and hatred for others and our own lives. The Apostle Paul can be okay when he loses his ministry to Christian pastors who can give him a hard time or even die in prison because his life has always been Christ. And if he dies, which is what he prefers, then he gets Christ. The secret to rejoicing in life is knowing that you exist for Jesus and that when Je and then when you die, you get Jesus. How can you steal the joy of a person who is ready to die more than to live? Everything and everybody else must come under Jesus in our lives if we want to rejoice. Your joy and mine, future joy and mine, will depend on how much more deeper we go with Christ. Your joy and mine will depend on how much more deeper we go with Christ, how much more we understand how much Jesus loves us and what he has done for us. And that leads, uh, in turn, that leads us to love him more, treasure him more than anything else. Only when you are more ready to die for Christ, um, you know, you, you, can, you can have all the joy that you want. Nothing uh, can steal the joy of somebody who's more ready to die than to live. Joy becomes permanent because if you live is Christ, but if you die, you get Christ at a more intimate level. Only when we can make life about that, only when our obsession and objective in life, our paradigm shift in life, our definition of life becomes Christ. Only when it becomes Christ, only when it's headed in that direction, you and I will have joy that not even death can take away from us. I hope we can get there. Uh, okay, so we can have future joy uh, when 
through a community that prays together. We can only have future joy when we do something as difficult as changing our paradigm shift of the very definition of life and when Christ actually becomes our life. Um, and we can have future joy when we live. If we are to stay on this earth, when life here on earth becomes uh, about the progress and joy and the faith of other believers. So we can have joy when we make life about others. We can have joy when we are generous towards others. We can have joy when we live for others. We can have joy when we have a ministry here on earth, a fruitful ministry, right? So it's one thing to die and get Christ. If we can get to a place where we want Christ to that extent, we will never know what it is like not to have joy. But if, if, if we are to stay here on earth, then then. Basically, Paul is saying the only reason why you and I are actually not having more joy by actually dying and being with Christ, if we have to stay here on earth, then the way we get joy here on earth is by giving of ourselves to others. That's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, I far, far, much, much more would rather die and be with Christ. Like that is my number one option. But if I must stay, what is more necessary is for me to stay so that I can help you grow in your faith so I can help you make progress in your faith and, 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 and help you find joy in your, in your faith. Paul is saying, if I stay, which is more necessary, I stay to help you get to a place where you know joy the way that I do, where Christ becomes for you too, to live is Christ, to die is gain. That's where joy is found. And if I stay, it's to stay to help you get to that place where life becomes about Christ where he becomes your life and where and that's where you get your joy from the only reason I'm staying is for fruitful ministry I don't want to stay I much rather die and go be with Christ experience that kind of intimacy with him but if I must out of necessity I am staying alive for you for fruitful ministry. That's the only reason why we're still alive. That's the only reason why you and I are still alive. Here, God has not taken us yet because, and He has kept us alive for fruitful me. We will experience fruitful ministry. If we're still alive, we will see fruit come out of our lives as Christians. Like it's inevitable. That's the very reason why we're still alive. The only reason why God has you and me alive is because He wants to see fruit come out of our lives. And that's, you know, what we need to do if we are to stay alive. You know, it's, it's like Paul is like, you know, Paul is almost saying, you know, it's like, like a, you know, if a guy you know, has a girlfriend, a guy goes on missions to a different country, and has a girlfriend waiting for him is like the guy saying to the girl hey i much rather be with you but i can't come to you right now uh, out of necessity i must stay in the mission field there god is doing a lot of things here so i must stay here and be in the mission field and i won't be able to get to you for the next 10 years it's something like that you know paul much rather go be with christ after his death but there is a necessity to stay here for the spiritual progress and joy in the faith of other believers. You know, and that's the only reason why Paul is staying. And that's the only reason why you and I are still here in this life. You know, you know that, that word progress, 
is the same word that was used in the previous passage when, uh, when, he, when he talked about the advance of the gospel. That word advance, this word prog, and uh, in, in that passage was the advance of the gospel. In this passage is the progress of the faith of uh, other believers. But it's the same word, in the Greek is the same word. And this word advance, progress, back then it was used uh, as a way of speaking about prosperity about speaking about financial prosperity, you know, social economic prosperity. It, it, was talk, it, was, it was used to talk about, you know, personal financial prosperity, prosperity in life, you know, social economic prosperity. But Paul is using it here uh, as a progress in the spiritual life of other believers. So basically what Paul here is saying is that for Paul, prosperity in this life he is giving himself for the progress and joy of the faith of other believers. This is what prosperity is for Paul, to give his life so others can come to know this joy that he understands, that of, of, of to live is Christ, to die is gain. Is prosperity that to you? What is your prosperity? If, if your prosperity and mine is personal advancement, social, economic, you know, financial prosperity, the most likely you and I are seeing joy diminish in our lives because that's not the reason why God is keeping, is keeping you and me alive. Our prosperity, our existence, our purpose must be fruitful ministry must be generously giving of ourselves to others for their joy in the faith. And when that happens, you will have joy. You will have joy. Um, so the way that we will have future joy, we can't do it alone. You will need a community that prays with you and for you. It's a complete change of mindset of success and prosperity in life where now success and prosperity for us becomes um, you know having this ability to die for Christ because we want Christ more than anything and if we are to stay alive it is to give ourselves for fruitful ministry if you live that way those are the things that for the born again believer will bring joy into your life. Nothing else, no other kind of prosperity will bring you joy. If you are a born again, new heart, you know, Holy Spirit living in kind of believer, in you kind of believer, the things that will bring you joy, my friend, will be prayer, will be loving Christ more to the point of wanting to die to be with Him, will be giving your life, your resources, your time, your expertise, your spiritual maturity to invest it in the lives of others. That's how you will find joy in 2021. Not by staying alone, not by not coming out of you know, your uh, room, not by only you know, trying to uh, just uh, you know, not, not participate in ministry, these are the things that are killing your joy. Once you start doing these things, that's where joy will come for you and for me as Christians. Pastor Rick Warren, in a recent letter that he sent to his church, he said this, what you need to know is that God has wired the universe so that happiness doesn't come from money status, relationships, or success. Happiness comes from service. God designed you to be happiest when you are giving your life away. Why? Because God wants you to become like Him. And it's all about love. To have a happy heart, you need to practice service and generosity every day with your friends, with your spouse, with your kids, with your co-workers. God also wired the universe in such a way that the more you give yourself away, the more God gives to you and the more blessed and happy you are. 
Sacrifice and service and serving are two of the keys to lifelong happiness. Generously giving your life away for the sake of the gospel. God wired this universe, and especially the hearts of the Christians, uh, to rejoice when we give ourselves away for the well-being of others. When you read this entire passage, uh, it's impossible not to see the fact that what Paul really here is talking about is that he's talking about that simply put, an unlimited supply of joy is only found when we rest in the all-sufficient person of Jesus Christ. Like Steve Lawson says, so ultimate joy comes from Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is showing us in this entire passage. Christ is everything to him, so nothing, not even, not even death, can take away his joy. Paul understood that Christ took a hold of him, that Jesus gave it up all for him, that to Jesus, to live was Paul. He came for Paul, he died for Paul, and he wants to spend the rest of eternity with Paul. Jesus came for you. Jesus came to die for you. Jesus came so he can have you for the rest of eternity. For Jesus to live is you. For Jesus to live is you, like Tim Keller would say. For Jesus to live is you. You know, just dwell on that. Just reflect on that. Let that sink in. And someday, a day will come when to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's not only the secret to joy, that Paul knew about, but that you and I will know also. Jesus made you his life. Make Jesus your life, and you will have everlasting joy. Let's pray. Lord, I am so ashamed to admit the fact that you are not everything in my life, that there's so many more things that I love more than you, that I would hesitate to even say that I wanna die to go see you because all the things that I love, I have in this life. Forgive me, Lord, change my heart, Help me understand what it means for you, for Jesus to live is me uh, so that I can know what it means for me to live is Christ. Jesus, I want you to become our greatest treasure. I want us to, you know, love you so much like Paul did after we understand how much you love us so that we will be desperate to die so that, because then we get to see you, then we get to have you, more, more intimacy with you. I wanna know what that feels like. I wanna know what that really means, because I don't. Help me know that, help our church know that, and help us be filled with everlasting joy the more we understand that beautiful and wonderful truth. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, let's do communion together. <clears throat> we keep Jesus' command to do communion as a way to remember Him, His sacrificial love for us, literally to the point of dying on the cross for us and His resurrection. We use the bread and the wine as symbols to do so. Not only that, but the bread and the wine are designed to show us that this is not the full meal. 
that we wait with great anticipation for the day we will enjoy the full meal with Jesus and other saints for the rest of eternity. Communion is not to be taken lightly and is for those who take their faith seriously. That's why we ask that only those who have publicly professed their faith in Christ through baptism partake in communion. However, we invite those of you who don't have a relationship with Jesus to prayerfully consider giving your life to Jesus during this time. You can get started by simply lifting up a prayer as simple as, Jesus, I give you my life, and you can start your journey there. In the midst of our busy and distracted lives, communion gives us a unique opportunity to refocus our lives back on Jesus. This is a good time for us to see if there is anything in life that we love more than Him and that we are more committed to more than Him and ask Jesus to forgive us and help us return to Him and treasure Him above everything else. This is also a time where we can be reminded that He is walking with us today, that we now stand completely forgiven, accepted, and approved before God because of Christ, and that He will never leave us nor forsake us. Also a time to remember that we have been baptized under the new name of Jesus, and we are under a new name, a new family, we belong to God's family. We are His children, so we should live as such. As we reflect on these things, I want to ask you to get your elements ready so we can do communion together. Paul said, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord... Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering the Lord, let's partake of the bread together at this time. In the same way, he also took the cup, after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Remembering Jesus' love for you and for me to the point of shedding his blood on the cross for us, let's drink the cup together at this time. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, um, for giving us this opportunity to reflect on Jesus, his life, his death, and his resurrection. Thank you for showing us how sinful we are, that it required the death of the Son of God for our forgiveness and salvation. Thank you also for showing us how loved we are because despite the fact that we were so rebellious and sinful, you loved us anyways. You still sent your son to die so that we can live, so that you can have us for the rest of eternity in fellowship with you. Help us understand these wonderful truths like Paul understood them. Let it do something in our hearts like it did in the heart of Paul. Help us to understand what it means to now be in Christ. Help us be amazed at this wonderful truth so that we too can love Christ more than anything and so that we too can make our life confession to live as Christ, to die is gain. Let our Christian lives here on earth not be anything short of fruitful ministry and learning uh, to know Christ more, of your love more, and to know how much more you love us, to have a deeper understanding of your love for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Okay, let's do the benediction. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.